Well, good evening. I want to welcome you to our worship services at Ephesus Church of Christ this evening. This is our class period. I'd like to begin our class period with a prayer. Brother Dwight, would you lead us in that prayer at this time, please? Let us pray. Lord, thank you for this good day that you've given us. Thank you for the sunshine, the rain, the good shower you gave us this evening. All the many blessings you give us. And help us to be good stewards of the blessings you give us. Always use them to the glorifying of your precious name and the wonderful name of your Son and our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And thank you, Jesus, for being that once and for all a sacrifice for our sins. Thank you, Father, for each one gathered here in this midweek Bible study. Pray that you'll be with the teachers of the classes and be with us as students that, that we'll take what is taught into our everyday walks of life and be better in the future than we have been in the past. Father, continue to bless the sick, those that are undergoing treatments, those that have had surgery, and surgery coming up, just bless them as only you know how. Continue with us now and throughout this Bible study. Forgive our sins in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. As all of you know, we completed our vacation Bible school last week, and I mentioned this two weeks ago uh, that. Our vacation Bible school is on the same subject as this lesson we're about to begin tonight. This lesson on page 33 in our book is Miracles of Jesus. Even though they won't be an exact duplicate, there will be a lot of overlap. So I'm going to try to move ourselves along and not let us drag this out. But if you have any questions or anything, comments or anything, do feel free to uh, speak up and let it be known. Uh, because I'm not trying to cut anything short on the lesson, but I do know a lot of the stuff that we'll be seeing in this lesson we did cover in Vacation Bible School, so we'll take that into consideration as we go through. Uh, Marge, I've got you down to go first with uh, John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, but we'll stop off with verse 6 for you. Uh, it says, On the third day... There was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come his mother said to the servants whatever he says to you do it now there were set there uh, six water pots of stone according to the manner of the purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece and we'll stop right there we'll pick up a verse 7 here in just a moment uh, with you Eric uh, I do want to point out here uh, couple of things well main the main thing when Jesus responds back to his mother when she says you know uh, tells him about the problem they have they run out of wine uh, Jesus makes a statement that my hour has not yet come uh, what do you think that means anybody yeah well not the crucifixion but at this, up so far as we can tell, up to this point, Jesus had not been doing miracles, and he had not began what we normally refer to as his personal ministry. He this was he this was his growing up years coming up until now. From this point on, after he does this miracle that we're going to see in this right here, we see him doing a lot of miracles, and of course he did others that are not even recorded for us. But the thing that appears to me, and I've thought of this before, when Jesus says, my hour has not come yet, it's as if God, 
his heavenly father has uh, planned out his life, I guess is the word I'm looking for. And he says, at the right time, you're going to do this. If you remember, uh, and I should have looked up which verse it is, but so far as Jesus coming to this earth, it says it was in the fullness of time. That's when the time was right. And I believe there's a lot of significance to that. God knows uh, his plan, and he is, he is following through on that plan. Jesus himself said when he was about to go back to the Father that he didn't, you know, uh, he didn't know when he was going to return. Only the Father himself knew that. So God was giving him this information probably as needed, uh, the best I can tell. But whatever it was, Jesus realized, hey, I'm at this point. I'm, I'm still in the growing up stage. But I have not started doing the miracles yet. And I believe that's what was on Jesus' mind when he said that. But what we see is that Jesus listened to his mother and he did respond uh, accordingly. And I believe it was with the, in fact, I know it had to have been within the approval of his father in heaven or God would not have been happy with Jesus. So we, uh, we know that had to have been uh, an approved Thing that he did to start this miracle. We'll go ahead and finish this. Well, I mean, what does your concern have to do with me? You think that was uh, uh, disrespectful? <laughs> I have thought of that one too. I, I suspect, I suspect there was something in their customs that that was probably a normal way to address her. I don't know that. We don't really, I don't think I remember ever reading what Jesus referred to her other than, uh, you know, his mother. Uh, I don't think he ever called her by name, which we wouldn't really expect him to call her Mary. Uh, that, that is a perfectly good question. Uh, anybody else have any thoughts on that? I don't, I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> Uh, I do know there are other, in, in other countries, there are customs that's very different from ours. Yeah, it would not be uh, disrespectful in some countries to refer to things in a, what I would say, a formal manner. And this is like a formal thing. It's not like the close relationship with his mother. So I don't, I don't have a better answer than that. Yes, Carol. Mm -hmm. Mom, yeah. I believe he called her mother. I believe he did. Let me, let's, let's see if we can find that because that's the that's the other one that was coming to my mind whenever we were thinking about this. It would be while he was hanging on the cross there, and I believe it's recorded in John because he was talking to, to John. Oh, I stand corrected here. Oh, um, no, that's a different Mary. Okay, he did. Uh, in John 19, verse 26, uh, you know, I'll start verse 25. It says, Now there by the, the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And then verse 26 says, When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, that was John standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own, own home. So I suspect that pretty much substantiates that was a normal 
customary way of referring to them as a woman. That was good, good catch there. Yeah, and there are some things we don't know, but what we we have already seen this in a lot of places, uh, and and Robert has mentioned it in a lot of his sermons. There are some things that are done differently in different cultures, and uh, and it may seem strange to us, but it may not be strange at all uh, for that particular time and that particular custom. So uh, that is just one of those th things that we we have to try to understand as best we can. But it's very good points. All right, Eric, picking up again with verse 7. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now, and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. This, uh, this beginning of signs Jesus did in, the Can in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed him. Oh, uh, here, you know, Mary has told his, the disciples or you, you do what, and the servants, you do whatever he says. And uh, he's had them to fill the water pots and then Jesus tells them, you dip some of the water out and take it to the master of the feast. For us today, that would probably be like, take it to the caterer. Now there's two things pops into my mind. I wasn't planning to do a whole lot of talking to this, but have you ever wondered who planned how much wine to have for that wedding? Now, I mean, I, we can only guess, but it, that's exactly what I think. Uh, it, was a, it would have obviously been a big one and they ran out it also indicates that, you know, it was a normal thing for people you know, at a wedding or whatever to serve the best wine first, and then if, if they need more, they go back and get the inferior. Well, in this case, they didn't have a backup plan. You know, when they ran out, they ran out. And that seems to be what has happened here. I will say this because it indicates when they had well drank, you know, then they could slip in the inferior and people wouldn't have that big of a problem with it. Uh, that tells me that it was truly intoxicating. But we also need, we're talking about cost, uh, customs and cultures and so forth, especially back in that time, uh, drinking wine was a very normal thing and their wines were not the highly alcoholic kind. You could drink enough to get drunk, I'm quite sure. In fact, uh, in both the Old and New Testament, uh, people were warned about getting drunk on wine as well as other strong drink. But in this case, they were, you know, if they would drink just enough that it would dull their senses. And I believe uh, we could kind of understand that. I have seen some people that were what I would call a little tipsy, but they still had control of themselves. They weren't staggering around and slurring their speech, none of the things we think of as being drunk. But you know, you could tell they were, you, usually what you see uh, is they're a little lively. You know, they, they, they like to talk a lot or whatever they're, whatever, however it shows up in them. But what we see here is when the master received that, whoever it was that was over the feast, when he found out this is better than the other wine, it, it struck a nerve with him. The wine that Jesus made by turning water into wine was better than the original that they had served. Uh, we don't see Jesus half doing anything ever in his life. And uh, uh, this is just a, a little bitty idea compared to everything else that he's done. 
that Jesus has always done things very well. And I think it's important also to notice that his disciples were seeing this. Remember, this is very early, and Jesus hadn't really gone out and started his what we think of as his ministry. So I'm quite sure that the disciples were early in their stages in believing him. So seeing a miracle reaffirmed the fact that he's the Son of God, and he's there you know, for a reason. And uh, I, um, th I believe that is a lesson that is taught to us there and to help us to believe as well. Steve, Luke chapter 1, chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. We'll go through verse 5 with you, and then we'll let Margaret pick up on verse 6. Uh, it says, Now when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, and that's in the Sermon on the Mount, he entered Capernaum, and a certain centurion's servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders to the Jews, uh, elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the, the one for whom he, uh, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving, for he loves our nation and has built a synagogue. Here we see a centurion, and this was probably a Roman centurion. I can't guarantee that, but that's what, I, knowing what was going on at the time, uh, it would make sense that it would have been a centurion. But this centurion had a servant who was dear to him. Uh, I have had, uh, in, in my working career, I have had some bosses, managers, whatever you want to call them, that I thought were excellent. Two or three was right up there on the top notch. And I believe they looked out for me just like I was their son. I really believe that. And I've had some others I wouldn't rank up so high. But I think of that when I think of this. This centurion had a servant that was working for him, and it was such a relationship that he was very dear to him. I believe that is a very good thing. Number one, it shows a good centurion, a good manager over his servants, but it shows a caring heart, and uh, and that's a really important thing. But his his servant was sick enough that he thought he was going to die, and so that's why I, you know, he's heard of Jesus. This is, a, again, a centurion, probably a Roman centurion, and he's heard of Jesus and uh, heard that he's, remember, he's doing miracles now, and uh, he wants some help. Uh, to heal this, heal his servant. But when the servants come to Jesus, did you notice that the servants told Jesus that he he is deserving of your service? You know, we want you to come, but he is deserving of this. Please do come and help, because he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. If he was in fact a Roman centurion. Building a synagogue for the Jews would have been very, very, very rare, unusual. That strikes me again in this particular uh, uh, incident as being something that was totally out of the ordinary. But it also tells me that God has touched people's heart in every nation. And even in the Roman society, Rome was not considered a, a religious, uh, uh, not a godly sin, uh, not a godly place. Uh, their citizens would likely have worshipped idols if they worshipped anything at all. Otherwise, they'd just worship themselves and whatever, whatever they wanted. That's what they would do. But in this case, this guy had obviously looked out over the people, probably the same people that he would have been a centurion over probably over the, the law things in that area. But in this case, he had built them a synagogue. I, I take that as a big, big plus for him, which kind of uh, substantiates what the servant says. He's deserving of you coming. 
Okay, Margaret, picking up with verse 6. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent his friends, or sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well who had been sick. Here we see Jesus now, he, he received this, this word that the, you know, the centurion is saying, I'm not even worthy to come in for you to come into my house. You know, but just say the word. And I don't know how much the centurion had seen or heard of Jesus, but that takes a lot of faith to even think that, much less to, to do it. But he explained why. Because he was used to, you know, I mentioned already, he had to have been a, a very good centurion and have a good hearted person to have done what he's already done for the nation and for building a synagogue for the Jews there. But here he says, you know, I've got servants under me and he says, I tell one to do this and he does it. I tell none to do something else, he does it. That tells me how good of a manager this centurion was. Uh, if you work for somebody who is really looking out for your best interest. Uh, if he told you to go jump off a bridge, you'd probably go jump off a bridge because that's the kind of relationship that can be built in a, in a situation like that. Now, the good thing is, if you've got a good boss, he's not gonna go tell you to jump off a bridge unless there's a real good reason to jump off the bridge. That's the thing. You build that relationship, and I believe this centurion had done that to such an extent that number one, all of his servants listened to him and that's why he was so concerned about his servant that was sick and about to die. But when Jesus saw this, he says, I've not even seen that great a faith in Israel. Israel was God's chosen people. And yet here is this Roman centurion that has that much faith in God. Uh, God has touched people in all ages, in all, all cultures, in all countries, and we can learn a lot from that because even when you're amongst other people that believe totally different, and we could have it right here in our country, we could have people around us doing terrible things, but that doesn't mean we have to do that. Uh, we can still put our faith in, in Jesus and go forward. This next, go ahead. Here was a religious person. Had to be. He wanted to build a synagogue. Yeah. Well, he, he had to have, uh, at, a, at a minimum, been sympathetic to the Jews, and probably he may have been a Jewish proselyte. I don't know. I don't understand all the process of Jewish proselytes, but Gentiles could be brought in, and they could actually be allowed to worship, but they were, they were real strict on how that happened. That, that was not the normal thing. You normally had to be a Jew to even participate in the worship in the in the synagogue. Uh, so I, I again, that would have been. There's a whole lot of things that's very unusual about this situation. This next passage picks up with verse 11 of the same uh, Luke chapter 7. And uh, Dwight, I'll let you take this. Now it happened the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and a large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead. dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. 
and a large crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and, and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, Arise. Arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak. speak. And he presented him to his mother. Then fear came upon all, and they glorified God, God saying, A great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited us. Uh, all of these stories thus far we have studied in, in our vacation Bible school. Uh, it was a lot, in the, at least in the auditorium class where most of us were, uh, a lot of discussion about Jesus having compassion. And this is one of those really good examples of it. Jesus really cared for people. And uh, uh, so much so that when he saw somebody else hurting, he hurt with them. And uh, uh, I do think it's unusual that when they were bringing uh, that dead man out, it was in an open coffin, but that may have been normal. I don't know. I, I, that, that's, there's nothing really commented about that. But it is amazing to me when Jesus spoke to that man and told him to arise, he sat up in the coffin. There may have been a reason why that coffin was open because some, you know, Jesus made that happen that way just for, the, for this purpose. But of course, then they glorified God and that's the purpose of miracles. We talked about this during the vacation Bible school. Miracles were not just to make a show. Uh, and they did wonderful things. Healing people was a wonderful thing. But the purpose of it was not so much for the physical healing and things like that that was going on, and there were lots of that going on. But the point was to show that Jesus and the apostles were speaking on behalf of God. The glory goes back to God. And you and I, again, can learn from that, that anything that we're doing, we're to do things to bring glory back to God. It's not about me, it's not about anybody on this earth, it's about God. And so uh, Jesus has done some very good things even at this point in his, uh, his uh, ministry on, on this earth. And glory is going back to the right place. All right, Carol, uh, Luke chapter seven. Now this is another long one. It's 36 through 50. Uh, we'll start with verse 36 and go down uh, through 40 with you. Uh, then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, uh, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping and she began to wash his feet with her tears her hair oh, or, or, or the tears and wipe them with her hair uh, the, the hair of her head and she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil now when the Pharisee who invited him saw this he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him. For she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say, uh, say it. And I should have left that for the next pass it next group but we'll get to that here momentarily here Jesus has gone to a Pharisee's house we talked before and after the vacation Bible school and during the uh, before and during the vacation Bible school the Pharisees were the strictest sect of the Jews they were the ones that were the prim and the proper and they did everything just right they followed all the specific details theoretically that's what they thought that they did and as Robert has mentioned out it's mentioned several times 
they, their problem was they not only kept what the law said, but they added their own little, little requirements, that they, and they made that just equal to the law, that uh, what the law of Moses said. But long story short, these Pharisees, they were religious, and there's no doubt about that. And they knew Jesus to be something special. They could tell something was going on here, but when this sinner, and uh, it's obvious that she was a well-known sinner. It wasn't, it wasn't the first time to see her. Uh, that would be like if we had the town drunk uh, here and, and, and all of a sudden he shows up. Everybody already knows who that guy is, you know. Well, she would have been whatever her, I don't know, I'm kind of assuming that she was a prostitute. I, the Bible doesn't actually say. But whatever it was, it was a known sin that this lady did. But you see, she knew who Jesus was. And I believe that's very important for us to realize. She knew who Jesus was and what he could do. And so she comes and she is doing her thing to show uh, her humility before Jesus and to do what she can for him. So we'll pick up now with verse 41, Becky. Uh, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore... Which, and this is what he's saying to uh, Simon, the guy that, uh, that invited him there. He said, Tell me, therefore, which of these loved him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered into your house, or I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with, the, with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time that I came in. We'll go, go ahead and finish it, Becky. I'm going to load up on you here. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are, for, oh, are forgiven. I got carried away, as I'm prone to do. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your Sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to, to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, we see that Simon thought, Well, now Jesus should have known this is a sinner here. I mean, this is no stranger. And he shouldn't have let him let her touch him. Y'all ever seen anybody don't don't touch him? Don't don't don't, don't touch anybody that you think is unclean or something. And, and frankly, that would have not been uncommon again in the Jewish culture. That's another one of those things. But the Pharisees, they are they're looking down on Jesus, is what they're doing. He said, well, if he knew this, he wouldn't, let, he wouldn't let that woman touch him. But if you noticed, Simon said that to himself. He didn't say that out loud. But Jesus knew his thoughts. And that's when he come back and gave that scenario. If, you know, one person was forgiven a whole lot more than the other. And he asked him, which one of them loved him, loved him the creditor more? He said, well, I guess the one who was forgiven of the, most, the largest debt. And Jesus said, you have, you have guessed right. You, you judged that correctly. And he point, makes the point that this lady, you know, her sins are forgiven, and she 
is forgiven of a lot of sins. Therefore, she loves me a whole lot more, frankly, than you do. And he didn't use those words, but that was the point. That was the message. And I believe the Pharisee got that, um, got that lesson from him as, as Jesus, the way Jesus said it. Because what Jesus said in the, the very last part of that verse 50 there, Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, I have heard people say that shows that you can just be saved by faith. But, uh, of course, at this time, Jesus had not died on the cross. There was, there, nobody was being baptized for the forgiveness of sins at that time. But what you see is you see a faith that causes people to act upon it. And that's what, that's what this lady did. She had so much faith. You know, if Jesus had told her to do whatever, I believe she would have gone and done it. Uh, and Jesus, of course, he had a, an ability you and I don't have. He knew people's hearts. And when people are genuine, you know, you look at what Jesus said to the thief on the cross. One of those thieves was making, you know, accusations toward Jesus. And others said, hey, he's up here not because of, he had done anything wrong, it's because of all the rest of us. And Jesus told that guy, said, you, today you'll be with me in paradise. So Jesus had that ability to forgive sins. The Pharisees picked up on that as well. And that also proves that Jesus is the Son of God because only God can forgive sins. Now you and I can forgive each other and, and say, okay, you know, I won't hold that against you anymore. And we should. That is the kind of forgiveness you and I do. But if you sin or if I sin, we don't take away that sin just because we forgive the other one. That sin is still there. But when God forgives us of our sin, it's gone. And I believe that's another important lesson that we learn from this one here. Jesus is letting people know, number one, how bad sin is, and this is how you get forgiveness. You put faith in me. And another good, again, very important lesson. All right, Brittany, we'll move on to Luke 8, verses 22 to 25. Now, it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake. And they were, and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and, and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water and they ceased and, and they ceased and there was a calm but he said to them where is your faith and they were afraid and marveled saying to one another who can this be for he commands even the winds and the water and they obey him now this early in this book, in this le lesson tonight, we've seen Jesus turn water to wine. We've seen Jesus heal a sick person without even going into the room with him. We've seen uh, Jesus raise a man from the dead. And we've seen him forgive a woman of her sins. And now we see him calm in a storm. Is there anything Jesus can't do? Even nature obeys him. Even nature obeys him. I believe with, with you know, all of my heart, this just goes to show how powerful God is. There's just no limit. And we shouldn't put limits on God. I believe that when we pray to God, that if God wants to do it, he can do it. And I believe that very much. But here... Again, Jesus does these miracles, not necessarily, I mean, it may be for their good there, but it's to help them to realize, I am the Son of God. You need to be putting your trust in me. 
and it was his disciples that he was he was dealing with here the the ones that would have actually had the best opportunity to know him the best and uh, uh we got to realize they were human beings just like you and me and uh we just have a hard time uh building that kind of faith it takes time it takes effort but uh that is what happened all right carol luke chapter 9 verses 10 through 17 we'll go down through verse 12 uh, with you and the apostles when they returned told him all that they had done and he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city called bethsaida but when the multitudes knew it they followed him and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing uh, did I say we'd go through 12 didn't I when the, uh, when the day be began to wear away the 12 came to him saying send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions for we are in a deserted place we'll pick up verse 13 in just a moment uh, looks like class is over already I didn't hear the bell uh, let's go ahead I'll, I'll read the rest because we'll, we'll finish this and it be done but he he said to them you give them something to eat and they said we we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people for they for there were about five thousand men and he said to his disciples make them sit down in groups of 50 and they did so and made them all sit down then he took the five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven he blessed and broke them and and gave them to his disciples to set before the multitude so they all ate and were filled and 12 baskets of leftover fragments were taken up after them again this is another one of those uh, miracles that we studied about during vacation Bible school but what we see in this particular one Jesus actually makes the food multiply uh, do you know if that food was cooked or did they eat the fish raw I don't know the answer to that I will tell you what I believe whatever state it was in for the little lad that they got the five loaves and two fishes on I believe that's how it was served to the rest of the people I bet it was cooked or or at least dried to where they could eat it. Anyway, uh, let's see. Carol, you did your... Uh, Betty, we'll start with you, Lord willing, next week. Thank you all very much.
Thank you for this day you give us all the many wonderful blessings we thank you for the food on our table the clothes on our backs and the roof over our heads lord we pray for the sick we pray for the people in need mentally physically and spiritually lord that you may bring them back to normal we pray for our government our people in power that you may help them make the right decision for our country lord we pray for all these things in christ's name amen
as mentioned Sunday, we, uh, we just got through having a, a very wonderful VBS, uh, very encouraging, uh, and it's always wonderful the, that, that time of year when we have our VBS, and uh, also, you know, VBS is, you know, it's more geared towards the young folks, and it's wonderful to see them excited and, and to see them here and, and learning about God's Word, and uh, as older I get, the more and more I get more from VBS. Uh, especially uh, having the opportunity to teach. Um, and I had the opportunity to teach the, uh, about 10, 11 year olds and they are very smart and they know a lot about God's word. And, and it's so encouraging to me to see that and to see how eager they are about studying God's word and learning more from God's word. And as I, as I was thinking about that, I, I thought about what Paul, uh, well not Paul, but the Hebrew writer in Hebrews 5 there in verse 12 talked about so for though this time you ought to be teachers you need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles and the oracles of God and you have come need of milk and not solid food for everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of God and of righteousness for he is an infant but solid food is for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good from evil you know all Everybody starts somewhere, no matter if you're growing up as a kid, growing up in the church, or you, or you just become a Christian. We all got to start somewhere, and that's kind of the milk of the word. You know, we build on that. Um, and I was thinking about that, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, you know, we, we look at those kids, and if, if we still see that they're still on the, you know, learning the same things that they're learning now, you know, is that, you know, is that what they need? Is that what God wants? Well, no, it's not, right? We know that, um, but sometimes we have to look at ourselves, and we have to really honestly, you know, look at ourselves daily, really, and see, are, are we truly growing as Christians daily, and, and can we say, you know, I, I'm a stronger Christian than I was a year or two ago, am I closer to God than I was a year or two or five years from now? And when we, when we ask ourselves that question, if, if the answer is, well, no, I'm just kind of maintaining, or, or, you know, I'm just, I'm the same. Well, that's not what God wants, is it? You know, God expects us as, as Christians that we grow, that we, we, we learn, and not only that, but we, we take advantage of opportunities to grow closer, not only to Him, not only uh, in, in knowledge of Scripture, but we grow closer to each other. And, you know, I'm so thankful that we here that at church, at, at Ephesus, you know, we have three different services. We have Sunday morning, Sunday night, and, and Wednesday evening Bible study uh, that there are great opportunities for us to not only come together to worship God, but for us to take time to grow closer to one another and take time to grow in knowledge. And not only that, but we have Bible studies. In fact, tomorrow night we have a, a men's Bible study at seven o'clock and I invite everyone to come. Uh, I'll be leading that. Um, but it, it's a great opportunity for, for everyone to have an opportunity to, to learn more about God's word and to learn uh, more about each other, you know, because we, we spend time with each other and that's a great thing. Um, and, and the ladies, they have a, a ladies Bible study, I think once a month. Uh, and that's a great opportunity for you to spend time in God's Word, to learn more about God's Word, to grow closer to God, and grow closer to each other. And so, as, as a way of encouragement, you know, we need to ask ourselves and look in the mirror daily to see, are, are we trying to grow closer to God? A am I really purposing in my heart that I want to grow closer to God, that I am making every effort I can to grow closer to God and to grow more in knowledge uh, for Him? Uh, I want to close in, in 2 Peter chapter 1. We all know, you know this to be the, the chapter that talks about the Christian virtues. Uh, but there in, in the last part, there in verse 8, it says, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind and short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, make all the more diligent to make your certain call, make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. So not let, we need to ask ourselves this question, you know, 
Am I, am I useless? Am I unfruitful? Am I, am I not growing? Or am I growing for, for the Lord? Am I growing in knowledge? Am I growing to grow His kingdom? Uh, tonight, if you're here and you're not a Christian, you have to begin your walk with Christ. But we invite you to do that tonight if you need to. And, and tonight, if you're here and, and maybe you feel like you've just not really purposed in your heart to grow for Christ and, and you need some prayers, we, we invite you to come up here so we can pray for you. Uh, if you need any way of, of invitation, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. Come to Jesus, he will save you. Though your sins as friends unfold, he will give your heart to Jesus. He will make it white as snow. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Thank you. 